Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Riminis. I've got an interesting episode for you today. I first heard about the case back in April of 2016. A listener from New Hampshire named Pat messaged me with this suggestion. And sometimes finding the right author and matching up schedules takes time, in this case, almost four years. So again, this case has been on my radar for a while, and I'm glad we were finally able to make an episode happen. And sorry to make you wait so long, Pat. Okay, on to the show. I am very excited to have as my guest today, J. Dennis Robinson. He is the prolific author of a dozen American history books, and he is here to talk about his book, Mystery on the Isles of Shoals, Closing the Case on the Smutty Nose Axe Murders of 1873. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for asking me in New Hampshire. I don't think I've Talk to an author yet from New Hampshire? Glad you're here. This book has been a real labor of love for you, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, what isn't? But, uh, yeah, this one was not like a, a book for hire. It was the book that I had to get out. There's like three more um, that are that are still fighting their way to the surface. But I've been a steward on the Smutty Nose Island for, I don't know, something like 20 years now, which means that among a group of people, the island is privately owned. It's 10 miles off the coast of New Hampshire and Maine. And there's a little cluster of tiny little islands. I mean, they're, they're just rocks. There's a little tiny bit of uh, grass, no trees, a lot of seagulls. Two of them are kind of highly occupied by Star Island, which is in New Hampshire which I can see out the window <clears throat> from Smutty Nose, is in New Hampshire. And Star Island has a hotel on it that's been there since 1873. And then Appledore Island, where Celia Thaxter, the poet, was, uh, is now the Shoals Marine Lab. But the other islands are either, they're all privately owned. And Smutty Nose is just kind of sitting there. There's nobody on it except whichever of us stewards is out for that week. We go Saturday to Saturday from May to October. And basically, we're just keeping a presence on the island for the owner who uh, lives elsewhere. It's a private island, but literally, when you're on those islands, uh, it's 1875. Are there buildings on the island? There's two buildings. The Haley cottage which we stay in which was built we think somewhere between 1770 and 1800 literally it's two rooms uh the attic is just unbelievable i mean you can still see the bolts coming through and the raw bark on the outside of the woods and most of the when kids stay they stay up there and then there's a little building to the side uh, that was built in the 50s one room no insulation uh, this is pretty raw. I mean, I would say most people, unless you live in a log cabin, you've never been in buildings this raw because there was, uh, there's no electricity, there's no plumbing, uh, there's no, there's kind of an outhouse, uh, a lot of poison ivy, a lot of gulls, no roads. When you come into the cove, which is the only cove at the Shoals, which has nine little tiny rocky islands, uh, you climb up over a giant rock to get to the front. There's a little bit of grass, and then you go up the hill. We do have a uh, gas-powered refrigerator, which never makes sense to me because this fire makes ice. Uh, but that's it, basically. When we want water, we bring all our food in for the whole week. We bring every supply. We, Unless a tourist comes up, we don't see anybody. And there's no facilities and there's nothing to do except walk the trail that I weed whack this trail to the end of the island, which is about three quarters of a mile. And people are routinely, we're out there in the late June. So the gulls have had their babies, which look like kind of little furry rats, kind of rats of the air. If you think of seagulls as these cute little things there, we're out there when they're attacking really attacking. I mean, they swoop on you, they attack you, they poop on you, they throw up on you. Um, so it's kind of raw. Not exactly a tourist island, but people come out 
row over from the other hotel island. But even the hotel is still very much 1875. You mentioned tourists. Uh, are they tourists just exploring the islands or are they coming because of the murders? Mm, no, the murder traffic. I mean, there was a lot of murder traffic in the 1870s, but uh, the murder traffic has kind of died down. The uh, They're staying at the Oceanic Hotel, which is basically was built the year of the murders in 1873. It burnt and was rebuilt in 1875. But it's, it's hard to describe how raw it is because people are, you know, they're looking for some sort of a modern hotel. I mean, people wonder if there's like a jacuzzi uh, If you stay in the hotel, I think you get three showers a week. The toilets are flushed with seawater. It's rocky. Everybody eats meals in groups. They have conferences. But there's sometimes three, four hundred people out on Star and a couple of hundred people out on the Shoals Marine Lab, which is I can see also out the other window, uh, which is pretty high tech. But it's this cluster of little little archipelago of, of islands and 10 miles from my house where I am now, uh, but really, really raw. Um, Right now in the winter, there's only one woman who stays out there all winter at the hotel and takes care of the hotel. So it's a little bit like The Shining there. (laughs) I was going to say that. Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine because it's, you know, it's right next to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is kind of the latest hot, you know, we're getting like sixth most beautiful heritage town in the world. We're getting all these kind of, you know, our property rates are going up like crazy. Our taxes are wild. We have a million coffee shops and a lot of historic houses. And I just wrote a book about the music hall, the historic theater, Strawberry Bank. Uh, It's really bustling. It's 10, it's an hour from Boston. Uh, Out my window here, I can see Maine from here and I'm in New Hampshire. So, but when you get out to the Isles of Shoals, it's silent. You know, you can see the curve of the coast all the way from Maine to Massachusetts. And when it's just so distant from the world, it's hard to imagine. And when you get to the far end of Smutty Nose, where literally no one has ever lived, ever, I, it's kind of like the Mesozoic era. There's nothing there but seagulls and seagull poop and rocks uh and that's three quarters of a mile from where I am. And our little house is sitting on the only grassy part of the island, which is like maybe an, an acre or two. And that's it. And that's where all the Native Americans were 6,000 years ago. That's where the fishermen were 600 years ago. I, I, as, I guess I should mention the fact that from the New Hampshire point of view, you know, America was not founded for religious freedom. That's kind of we, we call it the Puritan myth that. It was founded by fishermen, and the fishermen were at the Isles of Shoals. This is where the fishermen were in 1620, 1600. Um, The attraction to this region was fishing. And so this was a fishing island right up until literally the year of the murder. So from 1600 to 1873, so 270, 250 years of fishing on that island. And uh, John Hauntvet, that's how it's pronounced? I say haunt vet. I mean, I'm sure that somebody could pronounce it better. And that's where John haunt vet and his wife, Marin lived uh, in a house there in 1873. And that is a house that doesn't exist anymore. The house doesn't exist, although people insist it does. Um, The house that we're in looks kind of like it. um, And it looks old, you know, and that's all it takes when you get off a tour boat to see an old house, you know, But, uh, yeah, if you look at early pictures of the island, in the 1800s, there was probably a dozen buildings. There was a fairly good-sized hotel on the island with 20 rooms that was kind of already falling apart by the 1870s. There was a bunch of rooms. There was a big stone pier. There was a fish pier. uh, There was people's houses all around, clustered like almost like a little tiny village on a rocky hill, but really small. I mean, I'm talking about... You know, this is like one hole of a golf course. That's how big the whole area is. Uh, and they were all clustered around in this little area. But by the time the haunt vet showed up in the 1870s, it was all gone. All that stuff was gone. And they were the only 
people there. They were Norwegian immigrants. They were fisher, fishermen, family, uh, John and Marin, and they had come to live. They'd rented the island and the house, and they'd been fishing quite successfully. The trick about John Hontvet was that he was very successful. Most of the Star Island fishermen, because all the islands were covered with fishermen, were fading out because they were using basically one line, one hook, little rowboat. John had managed to, was successful enough so that he was very high tech. He actually had a little schooner and he was fishing what's called tub trawl fishing. So instead of having one hook, he would have a thousand hooks coiled on wires. So if you can imagine baiting uh, 1,000 hooks and then you run them out on the water with these kind of floating glass balls that hold them up and you come back the next day and haul it in. So he was really successful. He was the only totally successful guy out on the island. And he was successful enough that he was able to hire help, right? At least until relatives joined him. Yeah, it was, I mean, the tradition, the immigrant tradition would be that you would come out, you would find a space to lease. Uh, there was a big hotel next door on Apple Door, which and he was renting from those people. And th- that ho- hotel had actually been built in 1848. And was lots of people were coming out to that hotel in the summer. So even as early as the, uh, you know, 1850s, 60s, 70s, tourists were coming out from Boston uh, out to the Apple Door site. And the Layton family, who uh, had lived on Smutty Nose for a while, built the big hotel. So they had moved on, rented the smaller island to the Hontvet family. And John had brought his wife, although he married her here. So Marin was older than him. It looks like an arranged marriage that he brought someone from his hometown in Norway. And then, as you would do, you would bring over the family. So Marin's uh, sister Karen came over. Uh, and Karen worked nearby at the Apple Door Hotel. And then they eventually brought over Ivan and Aneta, who were Marin's brother and sister-in-law. And basically, they would work their passage off. John would probably pay for it. They would work it off. And his brother Matthew was living with them also. So this was very typical, as you would slowly bring your family over. In the process John was successful enough, so he actually hired people now and then from Star Island across the, or what was called Gosport at the time, from across the harbor, which is like, you know, a 15 minute row for me in a rowboat when I go to get water or an ice cream soda at the hotel. And he had this guy, Louis Wagner, who was Prussian, so they were Norwegian, he was Prussian, and he hired him for one season in 1872. And Louis kind of, although he was a fisherman, he kind of, uh, my belief is he faked having rheumatism and he sat around most of the season and Marin kind of took care of him. And it was only when John brought Ivan and Annetta over, they had like a duplex and Louis was on one side and the family was on the other. They ended up booting Louis out and he had to go back to Portsmouth where he lived impoverished in a flop house with three other fishermen and was dead broke. So he had kind of, he had a perfect world because he was being tended to for doing very little work. And then suddenly he was booted out and living in Portsmouth nearby. So he had experienced the life of the haunt vets and now he was suddenly broke and busted and unhappy uh, when this whole thing gets started. So you've established that he was definitely lazy How did he come across, though? Did he integrate himself well with the family? Did people like him generally? Yeah, by all accounts, people liked him a lot. He was a good-looking, strapping, 28-year-old Prussian nice guy. I don't know how the language thing worked because, you know, they, they, they must have all been speaking their version of English. But, uh, yeah, he was well-liked. He was considered kind of a ladies' man. And, Nobody had any thought. I mean, after the fact, Marin, you know, the surviving woman of the double homicide, she was the one on the island who did not die. Everything we know about Louis was written after the murders. So we get kind of this strange perspective because everybody's looking back uh, and trying to find the creepy things he used to do. But, yeah, he was pretty well liked. Uh, He was 
he seemed like a decent guy, but suddenly Karen and Karen, by the way, this, this is kind of a confusing factor, but Karen is working at the hotel nearby. So she's not living with them at the time. And so they end up moving Ivan and Annetta, the young couple into the other half of the duplex. Louis ends up back in Portsmouth on a, pretty much the worst part of Portsmouth in the 1800s. So let's say there's like nine houses of ill repute uh, on this road. There's a lot of, uh, it's pretty creepy. It's uh, it's really tumble down part of town. There's a lot of violence in this one little street, which faces the river. And then right across the river is the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, which is actually in Maine. And so there's a lot of soldiers. There's a lot of military. And Louis is ejected back into this rough and tumble world of prostitutes and sailors when he's just had this five or six, seven months of living like the life of Riley on the on the island with the Honfets. So he's he knows the Honfets have money and he's probably pissed off at Annetta and Ivan. He's not getting any work anymore. He's he's and he's he's dead broke. On March 5th, 1873, when in Portsmouth, he's sitting on the dock and all of a sudden on a boat in comes John, his brother Matthew, and Ivan with a load of fish. He's hired at that point, right, by John to help with some bait. Yeah, and this is kind of confusing stuff because it's hard to understand how this works, but by 1873, John, with his tub trawling, needs a lot of bait. Okay, he's not just cutting up a couple of clams or pogies and sticking them on a hook. He needs bait for a thousand hooks. And at this point, there's nobody in Portsmouth in New Hampshire who can provide that much bait. So the bait is coming from Boston, and it's coming on a train. And John pulls up, and he's got a ton of fish, and he's got all this money, and Louis runs over to him and it's like, you know, how are you doing? And he's asking these questions over and over again, like how much money you're making? How are you doing? And John, not suspecting anything, tells him, oh, you know, I have six hundred dollars saved up. The average fisherman's salary for a year is like two hundred dollars. So John has like six hundred dollars saved up. Uh, it's on the island. And he asks Louis if he'll come back at night because what happens is that the and this is kind of a faded thing is that the train carrying the bait is late and it's not going to come until midnight well it takes about six hours just to bait the trawls so they know that they're not going to start until midnight and they're not going to finish until at least six in the morning at this point louis starts saying well what about the women on the island because he knows that annetta and Marin are on the island. He knows that Karen isn't on the island because she's working at an, on another island. And he keeps saying, will the women be safe? Will they be all right? Are you sure you should leave them on the island? And John keeps saying, they're fine. They're fine. You know, and I keep thinking, hey, they're Norwegian. You know, they're, they're going to be fine. They're on an island. It's winter. Everything's OK. And then he says he will come back and help them bait the trolls. But he never comes back. Do you believe that he had been planning this for some time? And do you think that meeting John by happenstance on the wharf was the trigger for him? That he found his opportunity at that moment and decided to go for it? Yeah, I don't make much of it in the book because I'm not a therapist. But the guy comes off, if you pick up a copy of Cosmo and look up seven ways to tell if your boyfriend's a sociopath, Louis ticks all the boxes. Uh, And for reasons that I try to bring out in the book, I try not to psychoanalyze him. I try to let you psychoanalyze him by giving you all the details we have. I mean, I'm working from a number of books and over 200 newspaper articles from the time period and that kind of flesh out who he was. Of course, we only know him after the murders. But I think he's a creature of opportunity. He takes wild risks. He's probably thinking he will come back. But as soon as he walks away, he realizes that he set himself up. He knows the women aren't there. He kind of gives himself a mini alibi. He goes and has one beer. And then what we believe at this point is he goes down to a spot where he knows some friends who have a boat. 
He is a dory fisherman. And I, I keep pointing this out to people who come from <laughs> landlocked areas that he rows a boat for a living. And this is hard stuff. I mean, these are big wooden boats with big wooden oars on the ocean. You know, you can imagine these kind of uh, images of the boat, the fisherman from this time period. And he swipes a boat and he goes the 10 miles to the Isles of Shoals. This is hard for some people to understand that this can be done. And we're constantly dealing with people who have no idea how to row a boat or telling us that it can't be done. And that was one of the reasons I ended up writing the book. And he steals the boat. But what you have to understand is that the Piscataqua River, which is right running by my house here, is the third fastest navigable river either in the world or in North America. Our tides are eight feet twice a day. And so, you know, up and down. And so when you get in a boat in Portsmouth and the tide is going out, you can literally lift the oars up in the air and you can get sucked right out three, the first three miles right out to sea. And you can actually feel the undertow all the way out to the island, which is another six, seven miles. So he knows how to get out there and he knows how to get back. And he rows out. It's in March, but it's a warm March day, kind of like we've had a few of these recently. Uh, there's a lighthouse out there so we can see where he's going. And there's nobody else out there. He knows that there's two women in a house. He knows the door's not locked. He knows the island like the back of his hand, and he's going to go in and rob them. He knows that he thinks the six hundred dollars. He knows where John keeps his money, and he's just going to go in, grab the trunk with the money, get back in the boat, and disappear. The problem is he can't be seen because the women know who he is. Uh, explaining how this particular style of boat works is important in your story, because there are some conspiracy theorists out there interested in this case who believe that he could not have done it because they claim that it would have been impossible for someone to row back and forth in that period of time. That's their argument. And you are pretty easily able to shoot that down. Yeah. I mean, this is the rough part about writing the book is that it's so plainly, blatantly obvious what happened and the conspiracy theories come from a number of places, which I talk about in the book. But basically, if you know anything about boats, if you know anything about the stuff, he's gone for 11 hours, which is basically a tide. And he knows exactly where he's going. He knows exactly what he's doing. Again, he's not, he, I believe there's no intention of murder. His intention is to rob, sneak off. He's probably then going to get on a train, go to Boston, hop a ship, and disappear with John $600. So he has no intention of killing these women who have basically been taking care of him. But the trip out, it's kind of a rough trip out. But John mentions during the trial uh, later on that year, John mentions that he, when his boat was under repair or something, had rowed in from Portsmouth out to the Isles of Shoals 50 times. Um, so it's not something that is that strange to do. And he's a dory fisherman. This is literally what he does. I mean, I have a friend uh, who rode out there in his rowboat when he was 14 years old. Um, and then, of course, he went, holy crap, now I got to row back. And it was a little tough. But people are doing, I mean, I'm on Smutty Nose Island and kayakers who leave Portsmouth come gliding into the harbor every summer. Uh, one of the kayakers actually died out at the Isles of Shoals a few years ago because he went out a little too late in the year and he got stuck out on the island because uh, the, the tides are brutal. You know, it's it's hard to imagine. But if you're rowing from Smutty Nose to Star and it's a rough day, I mean, it's a quarter mile away. And when it's foggy, I can't see the islands at all. And if you get into like a slipstream, you just disappear. I mean, you know, you end up in Ireland. So... Wagner knows exactly what he's doing. He knows how to go with the tides. And the conspiracy theories are basically started by Wagner. I mean, he has no defense. You know, there's 34 witnesses who have spotted him coming back into town, who've seen him walking into town. He's all red, beat red after the murders. He's got icicles on him. It's seven in the morning. And 
He says that he's been out drinking. He doesn't drink. It, there's a million reasons why it's him. And when he's cornered, he realizes that the only person left alive on the island is Marin. So as the trial continues and he gets desperate, he finally says, well, Marin must have done it because I wasn't out there. Oh. <laughs> so he arrives by moonlight and he doesn't take the boat in at the main cove on the island, right? Yeah, it's kind of creepy now because we call that Wagner Cove, which is a little weird. Um, and I actually was out there last year pounding a sign in that says Wagner Cove on it. It's a very tourist sign. Um, but yeah, there's one cove on the Isles of Shoals. It's at Smutty Nose Island. There's one cove that you can smoothly roll a boat in. Everywhere else you have to have a dock or climb over some rocks or something to get to the island. It's very rugged out there. And he knows enough not to pull in the cove because if somebody sees his boat, they can hop in the boat and take off. Um, so he arrives on the island. It's a moonlit night. He's obviously hanging out for a while for the women to go to bed. What Wagner does not know is that Karen, who's the sister of Marin, who's been working at Appledore nearby, is in the house. She's been fired from her job. She's in a bad way. She's unhappy. It's all kinds of physical problems going on. She's sleeping in the kitchen. So there's, there's two rooms downstairs. She's in the kitchen with the stove. The other two women, uh, Marin and her sister-in-law, Annetta, are in the other room. Nobody's upstairs, but Wagner doesn't know that Karen's there. He thinks there's two women out there. He's going to open the door, you know, and I think he probably plans to, uh, I don't know, maybe he's going to knock them out. Maybe he's going to do something, but they can't see him. He's going to grab the trunk, hop in the boat, and take off because they usually would fold the money into the sheets in a trunk at the bottom. That's the best they could do for hiding money back then. And so he opens the door at some point when he believes everybody's asleep. And Karen, who's sleeping on a bunch of chairs next to the stove, wakes up and he doesn't know what the hell's going on. She's speaking Norwegian. He freaks out. He slams her with a chair. She's screaming. The women in the bedroom hear what's going on. Wagner fixes the door so they can't open the door. He's kind of pounding on Karen in the dark. She thinks John has returned with the fishing boat and has gone nuts. She doesn't know who it is. She can't imagine who it is. Eventually, she ends up in the room with the other two women, and Wagner has actually blown it from this point because the three women are in the bedroom with the money, and he can't be seen. So during this process, Marin convinces the young Annetta to hop out the window and go look for a boat or try to get help. Annetta hops out the window. Wagner sees her. He does not bring a weapon. There's an axe that's being used to chop ice off the, the well to get water. He picks up the axe and dispatches Annetta. As he does so, she screams, Lewis, Lewis, Lewis. She sees him and screams his name. So Marin is not an eyewitness. She's an ear witness. She doesn't actually see him. And eventually Marin hops out the window, runs away. Karen is too beaten to escape. And as Marin is hiding in the distance, she hears Wagner killing her sister. Marin hangs out all night. And in the morning, she finds that he's gone. And she's picked up by a neighbor. She uh, waves down a neighbor on the ne on the next island. And of course, she's all frozen and cold and freaking out. And she says, Lewis did it. And by this time, Wagner has rowed back uh, to the mainland. Ugh. And he uses an axe on both women, right? Yeah, both women are chopped up with the axe. Not... <sighs> Not as brutally as you might think. I mean, like uh, Annetta's ear is chopped off and, and they're chopped up, but both of them are actually strangled. He, he actually ends up strangling the two of them. And, you know, and, and there's the grim stuff, which I'm not like a true crime gross out guy. I'm much more interested in the, the context. How did this all happen? Why do we have a conspiracy theory? What what was the media like? I'm The few people that have not had a great time digging through my book are the people that just want to see the gore. That's that's not the guy that I am. I'm 
I'm fascinated by the story that, you know, haunts the seacoast and has been written about in Yankee magazine forever and why the conspiracy theory grew and became what it does. So anyway, both women are found uh, axed, but also strangled. And of course, the axe, I happen to be a member of the Portsmouth Athenaeum in town. And of course, the axe is sitting right there in a case, <laughs> which is, you know, it's hard to walk into the building and not notice it's there. Sure, sure. We don't get too graphic on this show either. But I wanted to clarify just because these are called by many of the smutty nose axe murders, and you just said that they were in fact strangled, but the axes were used too. Yeah, that's how he brings them down, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, I do a whole big long thing in the book about the axe murders and, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of freaked out by the way we treat axe murders. I mean, that, and I think the Lizzie Borden murders uh, years later, although she's acquitted, Kind of, that was 10 years later. That was 10 years after this. And people start to come to the idea that, oh, women can kill people with an axe. And I think there's kind of a, a back sense of Marin. Then they pick up on the rumors that, that Wagner started about how Marin might have done it. Then people start, you know, they start getting forensic about little tiny things like, oh, she had blood on her gown. Well, she came and found her sister and sister-in-law dead the next morning. So you would, you know, she also had blood because she'd been walking in bare feet over icy rocks at night, which is pretty rough. Um, and it was just weird. It's weird to see those. People had the story pretty much right for a long time. And then there was this kind of nagging conspiracy theory. And then, of course, if you know the story at all, you know it from the book or the movie Weight of Water. Uh, Anita Shreve wrote the novel, and Catherine Bigelow did the movie. And I, I think I was a little, you know, it's hard to explain, because I was a little incensed that not only do people have the story wrong, because if you read about the trial, it's, it's a slam dunk. And if you know Wagner's personality, you can un understand what's going on. And yet a novelist who had heard the conspiracy theory flipped everything around. She read the trial transcript and then very, very cleverly twisted it around to make it look like Marin. And then the movie does the same thing. And I, I just found it was, it was bad enough that people were blaming a woman that didn't do it for doing it, but it's the woman who survived and watched her family destroyed and was ruined by this event, you know, it just destroyed her life. And then she's made into the monster. I mean, that to me, that was like such a double standard that, and then I would have to sit on the island year after year and listen to people who'd read the novel because, you know, Oprah liked it and it was made into a movie with Sean Penn. Come and tell me how, what really happened because they'd seen the movie of the novel. Yeah, that must be a little frustrating. I can only imagine. So the money he was looking for, uh, $600, wasn't there. He found much less than that. Yeah, and that's part of the, you know, circumstantial evidence. I mean, then there's always, always people who think that circumstantial evidence means not good when they don't understand that, you know, most crimes, most people that are convicted are convicted of circumstantial evidence. This rarely a person standing there that sees the crime. And so Wagner tears the house apart, bloods all over the place. He actually ends up eating a meal with uh, Annette's dead body laying right next to him. And he waits a long time because he has to find Marin. So his bloody size 11 boot prints are in the snow all over the island. Remember, one of the buildings is a hotel. So there's 22 rooms. And, you know, she could be hiding in any of the closets. She could be anywhere. She could be in the fish house. She actually knows enough to hide. The wind always goes in one direction, so she knows which direction to go in so they can't hear her. She has a little dog with her for warmth and some clothes that she carries, so she doesn't want the dog to bark. 
she can hide. People talk about where she hid. There's a rock that people say is a rock formation where she hid, but the entire island is a rock. I mean, you know, this jagged rock sticking up all over the place. When Nathaniel Hawthorne was out there, he described Smutty Nose Island as the place that where God threw all the pieces when he was left building the earth. And he also calls it one of the most dismal places on earth, which is a bit of a bummer when you spend your summers out there. But <laughs> um, so, you know, Wagner is tracking down Marin, walking all over the island. His footprints are all over the island. I mean, why would Marin, if Marin had done it, would she put on size 11 bloody boots and walk around the island just to trick somebody and then somehow... So anyway, he ends up rowing back. Marin gets saved. He goes back to his flop house. He looks like crap. He tells everybody he's been up all night, couldn't sleep. There's all kinds of amazing stuff. He says he was sleeping on a couch. There was actually another guy sleeping on that couch. He says he was in the building, but his bed wasn't slept in. There were two guys in the bedroom with him that didn't see him. They locked the door at night. And then he takes off and he goes to Boston. He immediately leaves on a train for Boston. When he gets to Boston, where he used to live, he shaves his beard, uh, buys all new clothes, or buys all new used clothes, boots, hat, clothes, everything, uh, cleans himself up, and spends on the train ticket, the shave, and the clothes, and some food, exactly $16. Curiously, $16 is what's missing from the house. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty compelling evidence there. So once he's caught, word spreads like wildfire, right? And the fishermen of the area are especially up in arms. And a lynch mob forms really quickly they are ready to kill him. Yeah, I mean, he's immediately caught. He runs out of money. And he he's just a very strange character. You know, he he later later on, he kind of escapes from jail in a very clever way. Uh, he's very spontaneous. He'll take great risks, which is one of the signals of a sociopath. Um and in complete denial, you know, he sees himself as the victim because this mob is after him. The mob is gigantic. I mean, if the numbers are anywhere true, it's almost the entire population of Portsmouth is waiting at the train station. He ends up going to a flop house in the north end of Boston where he had lived before. And even though he's got a haircut and is all cleaned up, he looks like crap. He falls asleep. He's wind burned. He's exhausted, and he says all these really weird phrases, like someone asks him where he's been, and he says, I just went to New York where I murdered two sailors, and I have to go back and murder a third one. You know, so he's leaving these weird little hints. Uh, when he gets his new clothes, he's looking down at the boots that he's about to buy, and he says to the cobbler, uh, I have seen a woman lie as still as that boot. So he's, he's, something's going on in the back of his head, but he is a strange character. And as soon as he arrives at this place where everybody knows him, he's been there three years before. And he went, before he went to the Shoals, he had lived in Boston as a fisherman. They all know him. Some of them know him as Louis Ludwig. So he seems to have a pseudonym. And they immediately call the police. I mean, they don't know anything. And they call the police because he just looks like something bad's going on. He falls asleep. The police pick him up. He doesn't even ask what's going on. They rush him off to jail. He spends the night in Boston. A lot of people are waiting to lynch him in Portsmouth. But when the first train shows up, he's actually not on it. So they're all bummed out. They go back and go back in the morning for the next train. And it's quite a gauntlet that he has to run through. The local cops... Uh, actually shelter him. They're hit with bricks and rocks as they get him into the jail. And then when they get him back on the train, uh, they make a discovery because people think that Smutty Nose Island is in Portsmouth, which is in New Hampshire. And with a little bit of research, they find out that, oops, Smutty Nose is actually in Maine. The dividing line between the two states actually runs up the middle of the river and right between the nine islands. So he's on the Maine side, which means he's going to have to be transferred to Maine 
and tried and uh, eventually hanged in the state of Maine. So through all of this, he does not crack, right? The police are never able to pull a confession out of him. Yeah, and that's the great thing about someone who's got that kind of uh, narcissistic personality is that, I mean, he's really much more concerned about himself. He's, he, he, I think his theory is more like that he went out there to rob the women and because they woke up, they died. But it's more of a hindrance to his robbery than he sees it as a murder. He talks in the trial about how the Hontvet family were his only friends. And he has this thing, which is often a sociopathic cue, is that he exhibits behaviors that he sees other people exhibit. So whenever he wants attention or pity, even when he's on trial, he continually bursts into tears and starts crying because he knows that when he does that, it causes women to react to him. When he acts like he's sick or hurt, women react to him. And so he's learned all these ways to pull people in to him and he keeps trying these things and yet when he's in jail and people show up he he loves to talk to the people he's got you know at one point when he escapes uh from prison uh, during his trial he wanders around he doesn't know where to go he's lost he eventually knocks on a door and with his german accent he asks for directions to canada um, and they immediately turn him back in again. And when they ask him where he went, he said, oh, I didn't escape. I just I wanted to go see some of the girls that came to see me in jail. I just wanted to talk to them. I, I like the girls that came to visit me in jail. And speaking of that, he is pretty popular in jail. And many are surprised, probably expecting to meet uh, like a raving, deranged murderer. Uh, from all accounts, he appeared to be quite kind and docile even. It's funny because I was just, I mean, I, I always think of this as kind of like an early OJ thing uh, in some ways, but I was just watching that new uh, Ted Bundy series. And I don't watch a lot of these things, but it was really well done because it was told from the perspective of the victims. And one of the things I wanted to do with this was tell the story from the, for the victims uh, the women and for Marin who survived because, you know, as we know that the serial killer always gets the best lines and they're the ones that survive. And, and so this Ted Bundy series sp spends a lot of time focusing on the pain and the agony of the women and what, what, how they're messed up for the rest of their lives by these events. And yet you look at Ted and right up until the end, people are saying, well, he couldn't have done it because, you know, he's got a bow tie on and he's white and he looks good and he's cool and he's a lawyer. And it's only when you get to know these characters over time and you begin to realize that, you know, evil exists in the world, you know, that there are people who can really conduct these activities and not think that they did anything wrong. And I think his... And I make some theories at the end of the book as to why I think he managed to hold on to his denial right to the end, which is, again, leads to these crazy conspiracy theories. Well, if he didn't confess at the end, which most people did in the Victorian era, you know, you weren't going to go to heaven if you didn't confess. And he doesn't confess. But, you know, this nobody in prison ever did it. And this idea that just because he said he didn't do it does not balance 43 witnesses, and all the circumstantial evidence. And of course, the most compelling witness of all is Marin herself. Her sister called his name out as she was being murdered. Can you talk about some of the witness testimony during the trial, how the prosecution and the defense conducted their cases? Yeah, I mean, they... they did a great job and he had great lawyers. I mean, he really had good lawyers. One of his lawyers was a former judge from Maine. The other one, uh, Max Fischacher, I think is how you might say it, was, was Polish and was, was Jewish and was representing him because he said he was innocent and he was a Boston lawyer who tried desperately to find anyone anywhere. I mean, all that Wagner had to do was all that happened, had happened was one person. Could have seen him on the street any time between seven at night and seven the following morning, and he would have been free. 
The problem is that when he rows the boat back, he's, he doesn't go down the main channel because the sun's coming up and he knows that all the fishermen are going out and he doesn't want to be seen rowing a boat. Because if he's in a boat, he's guilty. That's all there is to it. Not only did he steal the boat and it's covered with blood, but he's he shouldn't be out there. And so he stops at this little island town called Newcastle and he abandons the boat and hoofs it back to town, which is, it was just, I'm writing a book about that island now, actually. And, you know, it's six, seven, eight miles. It's a beautiful scenic trip. It's like a, the mainland of Portsmouth and then two little islands that we hop over now. And you can drive over them now, but in the day they were bridges. And it just so happens that as he's walking back uh, in March, one of the bridges had been knocked out by floating ice. And there's a big expanse and there's a group of people from Newcastle who are walking into work in the morning. But the bridge is out, so they have to wait for a ferry. And instead of waiting for the ferry, he takes like a 20 foot piece of wood, hoves it across where the bridge was, gets on his butt and inches across that he has on his bloody boots and ice and icicles and his sweater. He's identified by three or four people there who don't know who he is because he's not from Newcastle. What the hell is he doing? Then there's a toll station where the woman sees him. There's maybe four locations that people see him walking into town. Uh, and they're all in chronological order. So, you know, even when he arrives on the island, a woman looks out her window and sees him standing up where actually there's a hotel there now called Wentworth by the Sea. And he's looking to get his bearings to figure out how to get back to Portsmouth. So he's seen by eight or nine witnesses in a row chronologically over time as he's heading back into the south end of Portsmouth to Water Street where his flop house is. And that's just the beginning, you know, that they they find a bloody shirt in the privy. Um, witness after witness comes up and describes things. And then he tries to the, the defense try to bring up witnesses they got nothing. I mean, literally, he was in a bar at 7.30. He had a beer. No one sees him after that. So he's explaining things like, well, I went downtown and I I threw up because I'm not used to drinking beer. And I lay on the ground for a couple of hours. And, of course, the police go through every 15, 20 minutes. And they don't see him there for hours. And he stumbles back to the house and it takes him 45 minutes to get there. But it's like a one minute walk. If you know the area, he's got nothing. And so the, you know, the prosecution very methodically, very professionally goes through each of these 43 witnesses. And then it's time for the defense. And all they got is Louis. So he's found to be guilty by the jury pretty fast, if I remember correctly. How long from the point of the verdict to the point of his execution? The damn thing about, the, you know, these murderers is that they're so curious. I mean, we're curious because we kind of understand how anybody can do it. And then we're trying to understand it as if we're trying to understand what would cause us to do it. I mean, you know, and we're looking at his personality. He gets on the stand and he rambles on and he gives this incredible OJ explanation of where he was right to the middle. And I try to show in the book how over time in the months it takes him to get to trial, he continually shapes his defense by taking in all these details that he hears and he keeps molding these ideas into his defense in a brilliant way. Also considering the fact that he's, he's multilingual. So, you know, he's, he's, Prussian and he's on trial and he's speaking in a trial in English, you know, he's doing the best he can, but you know, it's pretty obvious that he's got nothing going for him. So he is immediately convicted and he goes back to the jail. And that was one of the great experiences of this process is that the jail was brand new. It's, it's in a little town in Maine, the Shire town in Maine, where all the York County court trials are caused since the 1600s. Okay, so this goes back pretty far. But it's a brand new 1872-1873 jail that he's put into with the typical jail format, like three tiers that we're used to of the jails on top of each other. This is the beginning of modern jailing. 
and all these guys are lined up with these with these uh, three tier jails. And the day that he's convicted, he goes back, takes either a wooden toothbrush or a piece of straw or something, picks the lock on his jail cell, climbs up one of the the poles, goes through a scuttle in the roof, uh, climbs around, goes back around into the guards area because the guards, he knows the guards not going to be there, goes down in the kitchen, gets some food, goes out the side door and disappears for four days. Yeah, he was resourceful, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the confusing part, you know. And, and that's why I think we're fascinated, and that's why we're struggling to understand it. But what I wanted to do also, I wanted to explain why things happen the way they happen. And it has a lot to do with John being successful and Wagner being a failure. It has a lot to do with Karen. What if Karen had not been in that? kitchen and woken up when he walked in the door, what if he just slipped open the door, grabbed the trunk, put it under his arm, got back in the boat? We never would have heard of this murder. We never would have heard of the crime because it would have been so tiny. What if the train from Boston had not been late? You know, all these little tiny details that to me make up the narrative of the story and then all the background, why were the Norwegians there? Why were they renting? What was the island like? You know, and then we have the tourist response because a little bit like Devil in the White City, which is sort of a model for this, although I've been reading, what was this book? Um, I don't know if you've talked to him, but I got it written down here. Um, Adam, the, the, the guy just wrote the new book about H.H. H. Holmes. So uh, in yes, which I interviewed him. Well, you know, he talks so convincingly about how, no offense to the author of Devil in the White City, but how so much of even that book picks up on imaginary stuff, on legends. And, and you got to do your deep research. And of course, you know, I ended up doing deep research in some ways because a guy that I knew and his wife were writing a book about how Marin did it. They were going to prove that Marin did it. And I kept saying, well, it's fictional. It, it's a novel. They, no, we really think that Marin did it. So they went to Norway. They dug around for this, this supposed confession that she'd left on her deathbed, which didn't exist. You know, Anita Shreve made it up. And they actually went to Norway looking for it. But in the process, they collected 200 clippings from newspapers all around the country and not convenient for them, but they died and I was given all their research material. And I'd already done 20 years worth of research and there wasn't one tiny speck of anything anywhere that indicated that Marin had, had done this. And so it's a, it's a struggle. I got off my track here, but it's just, it's a struggle to when you're building this book, so what I was trying to do, oh, I know where I was. So in the Devil of the White City model, what Larson is doing, which is really brilliant, is comparing a gross murder, which probably has happened very differently than he describes it, and compares it to what's going on at the World's Fair. Well, in my book, in 1873, Wagner, a fisherman, is killing two fishermen's wives or two fishing family people across the harbor a guy has bought out the fishing island of star island or gosport bought up all the real estate kicked all the fishermen off and built a hotel so it's the very moment at which the murder occurs that fishing after 250 years on the isles of shoals literally ends because all the fishermen are bought out a big hotel comes in and it's this huge shift of this island after 250 years. So I try to go back and forth providing context. You know, what if John Honfett had a different kind of boat? And trying to track down all the little pieces. And I'm not sure that that's the way, that's the story that everybody wants to hear. You know, uh, I don't know. Maybe they just want to know how many times the knife went in and how deep. Right. I haven't read The Weight of Water before. 
what was the motivation given for Marin murdering her own sister? How, how the heck did the author come up with that? Well, I think the, the way it's cleverly plotted, I mean, depending on whether you like that book, which a lot, of, which millions of people did, because there's tons of editions of that book. I mean, just look it up and there's tons. And, you know, and I talked to Anita about it a number of times because she was out at the island and she's a writer and, you know, we knew what she was doing. She was writing other books at the time. She'd already put this book out. But like a lot of us, she had come out here and heard the conspiracy theories. And she often said, you know, she she did a little bit of research, but then when she started doing her research, it was pretty clear what was going on. And she said she just wanted to fictionalize it because it fascinated her. So she creates in the novel, Weight of Water, she creates a contemporary character who's a photographer who comes out on her yacht with her boyfriend or her husband or whatever with their kid. And she hears about the conspiracy theory and she's overtaken by this idea that Wagner might have been innocent and an innocent man was hanged for a crime that a woman did. And beyond that, history was meaningless to her. I mean, she stopped digging in and just ran with this thing, which is fine with me. I mean, that's how a lot of historic, you know, a lot of fiction is. I mean, there are people who think that historic fiction is fact when it's a bunch of facts glued into fiction. And she created a compelling story and it became a bestseller. And Marin's motivations, she she then had to make up all of Marin's motivations like, OK, she doesn't like her husband. He's an asshole. Uh, you know, she doesn't get along with her family. She doesn't like her sister. And there's a whole little sub theory in there in which Marin, I think in the novel, Marin has like a love crush on her brother and so she's jealous of her sister-in-law well in reality Marin was 10 years older than Ivan so that when Marin was 10 years old Ivan was a fetus so the idea that there was this kind of like and it, there's, there's a whole incestuous thing put in there and then of course Marin when Louis shows up is actually in the same bed as Annetta which is what you did in the 1800s to stay warm. People did not have this kind of thing that we got. That turns into a lesbian love affair. Uh, you know, and then of course there's this made up, which, and this is kind of a fascinating thing too. There's this made up uh, deathbed confession, which curiously does exist. Not the confession, but years later, I think it was a couple of years after the murders. Marin was living back in Portsmouth. There was an article in a newspaper that said, and I'm paraphrasing, the other day a woman on her deathbed confessed to the murder of her sister and sister-in-law on an island called Smutty Nose. And that was actually in a newspaper, but nobody could find it. For a hundred years, nobody could find it. And we found it. Uh, a researcher in Maine found it just as I was working on the book. And it was there. It's actually there. And thanks to the Internet, we could look it up and there it is. What nobody knew was that thanks to the Internet, if you go to the newspaper the next day, it talks about a hoax being perpetrated on the newspaper. It never happened. And also, Marin didn't die. <laughs> She was around for 10 more years. And so she actually had to live with this rumor. Well, Anita picked up on the rumor, fictionalized it, becomes a movie. And in the movie, Catherine Bigelow does some, you know, pretty clever things like when Marin is cutting up a fish, you know, she's looking at the knife and what's going on with her and Louis. And Louis is a much different character in, in, in the movie than he is. It's brilliantly done. And what, what I have been, you know, as an author, what I would like is I would like every high school class or college freshman class in America to read Way to Water and Mystery on the Isles of Shoals and compare the two and talk about how we do what we do with fiction and nonfiction. It's so interesting. So is this a subject that still fascinates the local population? Is there a tourism industry built at all around the murders? 
Not in a bad way. Um, I mean, I've been pretty pushy. You know, since the book came out, I have yet to have one person write to me and say, I read the book and I still think Marin did it for the following reasons. I mean, because, and maybe I made the mistake in the 400 page book of going down every rabbit hole, but I tried to do it as entertainingly. I use a lot of narrative fiction techniques. I try to make it exciting and interesting. I mean, there's a whole big folder all about the blood that was on him and he's got blood all over him. And they actually, it's very rare that they do forensic analysis of the blood. And Louis says it's fish blood. And a scientist comes in and does this whole big, long, dull, typical type jurist thing in which he explains about the corpuscles and he measures them with his micrometer and he can tell the difference between dog corpuscles and human corpuscles and horse corpuscles. And he says it was human blood. And that has is part of the trial transcript. Well, it was bogus science. It was completely wrong. We couldn't do that for another 30, 40, 50 years, figuring out that stuff. And yet it's a unique part of this trial because you're, you're having what looks like a modern trial in 1873, only, you know, like the DNA guy's wrong. There's no such thing as DNA. And so I went down a lot of those paths, the, the whole idea of the transcription. How was the trial transcribed? And I did a whole dig onto, this was one of the early trials in which someone actually tried to produce sort of a word for word transcription, which was very rare because people would just summarize it. But what was happening was that there were more and more lawyers showing up and lawyers need a lot of books to put behind them while they're charging you your bill. And people wanted to get these cases. So the, the transcriptionist would copy the words down, but not as accurately as you might think. So I dug into that whole concept of how transcriptions were formed and then sold as books to lawyers because we have the trial transcript, which is also extremely rare. There's, I mean, there's half a dozen copies of it out there. I was working from a Xerox copy. Anita Shreve had a copy when she was writing it and she used a lot of the dialogue from the trial transcript, which is what makes her novel seem amazingly real because it is. And she's mixing these two things. But, you know, I just keep saying, how fair is it? I mean, if I, what if I write a really good book about the Kennedy assassination? It's a novel. I mean, I know that Stephen King already did it. But if I write a novel like that and then I take your grandmother and I look her up and I make her the woman behind the grassy knoll that actually killed Kennedy. And she was real. She was a living character. How fair is that? At what point is it okay? And what point is it not okay to mix the two genres? I didn't answer your question at all. <laughs> well, your answer was very interesting nonetheless. <laughs> but, you know, there's no, I mean, there's a, you know, I, I joke about this, um, because there's a ferry boat that goes by and, you know, you can hear the guy talking about the ghosts and the pirates. Well, there were no ghosts. There were no pirates. I've actually written about the whole pirate thing. Uh, Blackbeard did not drop his 14th wife off on one of the islands at the Isles of Shoals to guard his treasure. None of this. I mean, the islands are solid rock. You know, this there's about there's a, between six inches. We just... I wrote another book about Smutty Nose about the archaeology, and there's between six inches and two and a half feet of soil on little spots on the island. The rest is rock. So no pirate worth his salt is going to bury his treasure in solid rock, even though I went out to one of the islands once with the History Channel, and they actually drilled into solid rock because a little old lady had told them there was a cave and her father told her when she was eight that that's where the treasure was. And we get a lot of this stuff. So the ferry boat goes by and we hear them. They used to be pretty bad, you know, talking about this and that. They've gotten a little bit better. You know, the people that are doing the tours aren't completely exploitative. 
But then one, and we can see these ferry boats. I mean, they're right in front of us. It's a big boat with 400 people, 300 people on it. But most of them don't get off. They just kind of tour around the island and then they go back. And there was a brief period in which a female friend of mine and I, we would dress her up in a nightgown and I would chase her around on the lawn with an axe when the tour boat came <laughs> uh, just to see <laughs> what the tourists would do. And I stopped doing that because I was afraid that if they all ran to one side of the boat, it might tip over and then I would have killed 400 people. <laughs> right. So, you know, writing the book was sort of my form of therapy so that I could stop I mean, even now when people come out on the island and, and if they say, I hear there's a conspiracy theory and I and I will tell them, yes, and everybody who mentions it is immediately killed and buried out back. Um, and, and of course, to make it worse, we always leave a couple of axes leaning up against the house, you know. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's because it's a rough island. I mean, we get people come off, you know, row out in a rowboat for the first time they've ever been in a rowboat and they have sandals and they don't seem to understand that they're on an island that's full of rocks and poison ivy and they're going to be attacked by birds. You know, they, they, this is foreign to them. And it's, you know, we're only out there for a week, so it, we're OK. But it must have been pretty rough living out there in the 1800s. Yeah, yeah. Well, if anyone can do it, it's those stoic Norwegians. Exactly. Exactly. That's That's part of the, you know. And it's and why is it Norwegians? I mean, I devote a whole chapter to, you know, actually, in some ways, Celia Thaxter, who's a major character, has kind of a racist view about Norwegians. She thinks of them as these wonderful little obedient people who make great servants uh, and are white. You know, she she has no interest like most people from New England in the 1800s or as racist as they are in the South. And so she likes these people because they're subservient and Caucasian, you know, and there's a lot going on in any story. You can pick any story and, and dig around in it forever. But I guess, you know, if you pick an axe murder and use it in the title, you maybe a few more people are going to look at it. But it is kind of subterfuge. I mean, I used to teach science fiction to kids and. I was using the science fiction, and when they found out they were going to read Frankenstein and Gulliver's Travels, and they were like, what's this? This isn't science fiction. It's like, no, it's actually literature. I tricked you. <laughs> so I guess I, that, that's my background, is I, I come from this as a high school teacher who, you know, you have to uh, you have to get people's attention before you can try to tell them something. So for people who want to learn about you, would you tell us about your website? Is this my vanity site that I just put up, which is uh, painfully the letter J, jdennisrobinson.com? <laughs> I mean, I really was embarrassed. I was embarrassed all alone in a room buying that domain name. So that's how, you know, but I was told that you have to do that. And, you know, it, all my books are up there and you can, they're all on Amazon. Some are, I mean, actually, the, a lot of them are in the used category now. And so you can, you know, buy some of the best things I ever wrote for a buck. I do have one. I mean, I keep thinking I'm going to swap to fiction because, you know, we know nonfiction is not a, uh, <laughs> it's not a wise career choice, particularly local history fiction. Although I am working on a book about Betty and Barney Hill, who lived down the street here, who were the first, uh, in quotes, UFO abductees. And I expect that I will receive multiple hate mail because I take a sort of skeptic point of view, having known Betty and talking to her a lot. Um, and then basically that's where the entire, no, I know we're swapping genres, but that's where the whole, uh, it's their story, the Hill story in 1961 that basically created the little gray alien, the anal probe and the, I was abducted because I've been hypnotized genre. <laughs> um, you know, and they were, and nobody's ever written a non-paranormal book about them. I mean, nobody's ever tried to say, wow, this was an interracial couple that was having marital problems. And in the middle of a time period when UFOs were the really cooking in the 1960s, you know. Sounds interesting. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much uh, for taking some time to chat about your book with me today. Well, thank you. Yeah, keep it up. 
Again, I have been speaking to J. Dennis Robinson, author of Mystery on the Isles of Shoals, closing the case on the Smutty Nose Axe Murders of 1873. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobweb corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.